trying to share a little bit of our own experiences as well as trying to give some uh, pointers uh, in, in how we might, if we'd known what we know now, then how we might perhaps have done things differently. At least that's from, uh, from my point of view. Um, perhaps another good reason is to stand still is I think the camera's focused very narrowly on my face. So apologies if as I wander around it becomes a sort of disembodied radio show. So first of all, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the situation that I found myself in, colleagues found their selves in, you'll find yourself in. So I graduated from Bristol. <laughs> know your audience, James. Uh, there's me on my final year holiday, uh, naive and excited, and maybe not surprisingly alone. Um, <laughs> looking forward to a flourishing career uh, helping animals, saving lives, and making differences. And I was very conscious of um, the oath uh, that was about to, to undertake. I think the oath, it's less that we have a duty because we've sworn an oath, to me, it feels more like the oath is an articulation of a duty that we know we have. It's a way of uh, telling the rest of society, this is what we're going to do. But perhaps, I think it's, it's fair to say I had a bit of the rose-tinted spectacles, even after, thank, thank you, even after um, seeing practice and conversations with colleagues, you still, I think, to some extent, whatever we say to you, until you're there, Suddenly, you're the ones making the decisions, uh, and of course, it's different. Then, in practice, of course, you see some pretty horrible cases. Um, it, money becomes important uh, as part of... Obviously, that's not actually money. That would be amazing if they were all <laughs> lying horizontally. Um, you have a boss, uh, which... Uh, and at some point, you might become one as being even worse. Um, You've got to work with colleagues. Again, I've worked in charity as well as private practice. And, of course, you're dealing with owners who, uh, in some cases, are, are frankly ridiculous. <laughs> and that puts you in a, a number of difficult situations. In particular, in ethics, what we fo focus on is about difficult decisions. And that's for a number of reasons, sketching out a few. So patients have owners, as we say. That, that creates complexities for a number of the cases. Or, of course, when patients don't have owners, that creates complexities for cases. The practices themselves need to survive and thrive. That involves money. That involves staff working together. Um, and you see things that... See, I knew I should have stayed still. You see things that you think should never have happened, but they do. And there's no point being sad that they should never have happened, because they have. And you are in a situation where you need to do something about it. But it does mean, as well as the stress of making those decisions, actually you're seeing some of the horribleness of the world, not just in charity practice, in private practice too. You're seeing people being neglectful or willfully uh, malicious to vulnerable dependents, and that's quite horrid. You're doing what you think, hopefully, is best in the situations, but be partly because they're bad situations and partly because, in retrospect, you think maybe I'd have done it differently, you get that feeling you're not always doing what's best. At most, you're doing what's best in a bad situation. Sometimes you feel taken advantage of, again, especially if owners can't or won't pay, but you still feel you need to help the animals. So rather than thinking of that as some wonderful altruistic thing, we feel somehow that we're letting the side down or feel taken advantage of. And, of course, that does impact on our morale, and the situations themselves are a source of, of stress, and I think other people may echo that. I thought I'd talk a little bit about some of the more specific situations. I did this, I remember, fairly early on in practice, did a little tally uh, of what happened uh, for a couple of us in an average day. And it's fair to say that in most of these situations, so... Uh, there aren't massive ethical dilemmas. I don't want to paint this as every single case goes to some enormous soul-searching. A lot of the time, you're basically switched off uh, talking about holidays. So, but vaccinations, anal glands, diarrhea, euthanasia, of course, one has to do again. Not every time, actually, is that enormous soul-searching. Sometimes it's fairly clear to us, and sometimes it's useful to work out why that's clear, because that can help us in other cases. Um, one animal, this was, a, as I say, a little tally, was not himself, and that was a... Uh, splenic tumour that got removed. Uh, another 
case was lethargic uh, or so lethargic uh, the hamster was dead. <laughs> So I, to well, so I told the, um, the boy, uh, and again, that's an emotional, difficult situation. The boy in uh, floods of tears, well, there's, no, you know, there's nothing you could have done about it, um, except not get a blooming hamster uh, for a kid. Um, never, never mind, you know, ne carry on, get, get another pet next time. And uh, put the hamster away and carried on. And it was only uh, later that the nurse came uh, to say, you know that hamster who was dead? Uh, he's, he's less dead uh, now. Uh, there's a clinical point in here, but really from that ethical interest was, uh, so I now have a dilemma whether I tell the uh, owner um, that, and I did, I had to, to speak to him, I can't, I can't keep this, this hamster. I kept him overnight, gave, gave him some honey, didn't really, and uh, some water, and the, the next day phoned her and said, yeah, you know that, that hamster that, uh, who I said was dead? Um, well, we did all sorts over the night. <laughs> Honey has enormous medicinal properties, and um, uh, I, I got a, at least a little bit of kudos, if perhaps tongue-in-cheek, even from the, the owner. <laughs> then, of course, there are some more complex, more uh, deep situations. And again, I, I put this one up to tie in particularly to the next couple of of talk. So we actually had in one in a private practice where I worked for several years and was very, very happy indeed, uh, but we had a relationship with at least one breeder who was breeding caesareans. So of course it should come as no surprise to anyone that there are concerns about breeding uh, of dogs both, well there's all sorts of issues uh, with breeding uh, English bulldogs, but one of them is the, the discrepancies in size so that they may need caesareans uh, to give birth because they can't easily give birth naturally often. But of course these may well present as an emergency. Some of them present as electives, but not, some of them are emergency situations. With an owner, I should add, who isn't keen to spay because it's her job or hobby uh, to do this breeding. So to try and help out in these emergency situations, you are effectively perpetuating these welfare problems. And not only is that impactful on the animals, but you also feel a bit complicit. So again, on the one hand, you're trying to help. On the other hand, you feel complicit with something that you think is morally problematic. And that's a difficult circle to square. In addition, in this and a number of other cases, there were some concerns from nurses about them being involved. And obviously, this kind of uh, caesarean surgery, you need that nursing support. Support. Other, an, another good example, I remember one where the, the, the belief was it was a, an error from a colleague, maybe a sterility issue during surgery. So afterwards there was a wound infection, there was a fairly horrible peritonitis. The case had gone on for a little bit of time. I took over this case and uh, euthanasia appeared to be the, the issue. So as well as the difficulties in working out what to do, and this was still, it felt to me, and I'm still think what was the right situation in a difficult situation. So again, this is a situation that shouldn't have happened, but did and will happen. Of course, there were all these other issues of what do you say to the owner? A general principle of transparency, but are you going to be adding to the owner's distress by, by doing that? By keeping quiet, uh, are, you, uh, are we not, are we disincentivizing any change because the vet as a, in a, this is going to sound callous, but has got away with it, at least in the wider thing. Again, uh, she, he or she may well have their own distress that, of course, would be a learning experience. And again, this was distressing for staff. Then there were a, a case where I thought I'd made an error. Um, again, the clinical, whether it was or wasn't, or the clinical aspects, I definitely thought I had. So a cat kept in overnight, bag was empty, the cat was dead you know, a lot of fluid coming from the airways. So I was, at this point, and again, uh, not, without getting into the details, thinking, well, have, have I done something wrong here with the, the, the drip? This fluid's gone somewhere. Is that, if that's not post-mortem, then is that, has that precipitated the cat's demise? Again, the owner was very distressed. Again, this issue of transparency. Um, and then you become slightly weirdly trying to look at yourself and trying to, to do stuff that's going to help you learn and not let yourself get away with it. And you get in some weird morass of, of trying to both create and avoid your own guilt. And again, there were some uh, 
nurse distressed. The nurses weren't always distressed, uh, I should add, uh, but these were particularly distressing <laughs> cases. And then a um, couple more. So we got a call from the RSPCA because this was uh, down in England. So one call was about uh, some two goats that people had found in distress. Um, and we got there, and there were two goats, so that bit was on the nail. They were pretty happy goats just in someone's garden. So there's really limited value I could add, I thought, as a vet here, um, you know, beyond a, a, a quick chat with, with one of them. And then similarly on deer, got called out to deer. One of the things about deer, unless they're non-ambulatory, uh, is they move. Um, so I got there and I put a photo of it. Uh, there wasn't a deer there anymore. So again, that tested my veterinary skills to really help that deer um, because uh, she wasn't there. But obviously, we've got a general principle of trying to make uh, notes, so I didn't want to not record these anywhere. By doing so, of course, that means that the partners will notice that. And uh, as I expected, the partners would wanted these two cases, which both happened in the thick of the night, uh, to be charged for. But I didn't really do anything worth charging. Oh, that's me putting the goats as happy. <laughs> and you feel very much pulled in different directions. You've got these various responsibilities to all these different uh, stakeholders, and you can't please all the people all the time. And we had there, you know, I, I guess you could try and say, right, I'm going to just do whatever the owner wants. I think that's washing one's hand of, of one's responsibilities. You could say, well, it's about clinical autonomy, but you still need to be making those decisions. Or you can try and work things out from a welfare point of view. But again, even that's easier said than done, both to work out what's right for the animal in a difficult situation. And because often what's right for the animal depends on what the owner's going to do. And of course, also through all this, uh, a vague, vague, yeah, vague is probably the right word, idea of what the RCVS would want us to do, which isn't necessarily very clear, perhaps. I think fair enough, because the RCVS wants us to be making professional judgments, but it means you don't have that confidence. And the other thing that these various inputs or aspects meant is actually I found I could justify pretty much anything I wanted to do in any case. You can come up with some reason for some stakeholder, for some outcome, to justify pretty much anything. So how do you weigh all those up? So I think... I thought I would talk very quickly about some of the ways I found... This is, again, meant to be some deep sort of philosophical idea. But this is part of what got me into ethics, because it's about deciding what to do, what kind of person we want to be in life. And, of course, you do end up being a bit theoretical, but it's about practical decision-making. Again, I think this was a little epiphany for me, that actually there, there is a school, a discipline that is about helping you decide what to do. To avoid some of these biases, to avoid claims that I think I can justify, and to help us reflect on our decisions, not in some destructive, over-analytical way, but in a constructive way to work out what's going to help next time. And also to relate to others, because they are going to have different ethical viewpoints, colleagues and owners, in, and the public in particular, that actually I I, I need to get my head into, if only to communicate better. And then when I have done things, I want to be confident that I've made the right decision, at least where I, I can. So, of course, it, it, it gets into these controversies, but it seemed to me to be useful. And, of course, you can read, this is a, I borrowed this slide from another talk, a whole wealth of complex philosophical literature um, with all these people, and there were some sort of big hitters uh, not on that list, but really it's, uh, I thought I'd, I'd make a few points of some of the epiphanies that occurred to me that I found very useful in practice. Again, they're not very detailed. One is I, it was a bit of an epiphany to think of, right, this veterinary privilege is a privilege, not just in a nice sense, but in the sense that society is trusting me to do this veterinary work. And in return for that privilege, there are some downsides. I have some responsibilities alongside that right, partly because us being vets means other people can't do veterinary stuff. So we need to step up to do stuff because other, we're effectively stopping other people doing it by our uh, monopoly. Yes, this focus on animal welfare, absolutely. I think that's, it's, it seems so easy to say, 
and then it seems hard to do, but it isn't hard to do. You just have to keep that focus on animal welfare, recognizing that what's the problem is the, the reality in which you're trying to work. So you can keep that deep focus. It's not about being ro the rose tintedness is about how easy that would be. So we don't give up on that focus. We just recognize their different difficult situations. And being, sorry, I'm now drinking somebody else's water. Being, that's another ethic, that's a minor ethical issue, I think, <laughs> theft. Uh, they're not easy decisions. So again, ethics isn't going to make these decisions easy. So I say, it was, a, a, it was a realization for me that I can justify anything. So having a reason to do something is not necessarily a good determinative reason to do something because, of course, there are reasons on the other side. And again, another little epiphany that you can't do everything. We have limited resources of time, money, uh, em empathy even, you know, sort of mental uh, passion, oops, that we can't do everything. And as, as Heather said, I did, if you like, m take an active decision to, to be that advocate inside and outside of the consulting room, or on or off the farm. And again, I thought, I found this very useful, this idea to think, well, maybe in each situation there's a best to worst outcome for the, for the um, animal, that welfare focus rules out some of the worst, the constraints may well work, rule out some of the best. And we just, to some extent, have to accept that. You might want to then try and change the world, but accept in that case that you have to act in those constraints. Constraints like limited resources of time uh, or money, of law on the assumption we need to operate within the, the law, including property law, and owners have, have property. Information, we might have limited information about the animal, limited information from the owner, owners aren't even honest every time. So we have to deal with that constraint. Colleagues, we are having to work with colleagues, including owners who have a role in looking after their animals. It may be because of um, owners' unwillingness or inability that actually that rules out some options. And of course, issues with the animals themselves. And again, I found it useful to remember that vets do need to make a profit. We need to be a, I don't think we need to be a, a sort of major focus, focusing on the profit, but as part of our welfare work, it's a legitimate side effect in order to make sure that the veterinary practices are sustainable, bless you. And owners do have a responsibility to pay. And again, I thought that it sounds an obvious thing to say, but remembering that gives you a bit of strength in some of those consultations. Again, there might be owners you feel sorry for, but that's very different, I think, from, from just feeling bad about asking for money. But of course, there are these others, and I might uh, declare a conflict of interest uh, as RSPCA funding uh, initial emergency treatment. Um, but we also, for those animals who don't have owners, strays and wild animals, Giving some emergency care to them seemed to me to be a trade-off from that um, privilege, and we can include that uh, in, in what we do. In fact, in a way, that makes it less lovely, because we're saying, actually, that's just something we should do. It's a, it's a duty rather than some going above and beyond. And very quickly, to think about the some of the applications back to these uh, cases now. So with the Bulldog Caesarean, what I actually did was effectively nothing. I kept fairly quiet. I did say I wouldn't do it if it was elective dur you know, during the day when other people were around. But frankly, I was the newest graduate. The owner probably wouldn't wanted me to be doing their expensive bulldog cesarean anyway. So it was really only about emergencies anyway. I think now I probably would be stronger, recognizing that's easy to say and then really hard to have those conversations. But I think I wish I had. By good fortune, it didn't come up. And I'd probably said, well, I will do it only with neutering of that um, bitch. Again, recognizing that is going to be an awkward conversation with the owner who will say no. And maybe it, the way to do it was a conversation with the, the partners to say, well, let's have one of you on second call. They love that, partners. Um, <laughs> in order to back up at least on, on this. The other thing I think I have done is thinking, well, if, if I am worried about being complicit, are there ways I can offset that, a bit like carbon offsetting, by doing other work? And again, I think this is probably one of the motivations that led to me and to others here, doing more advocacy and stuff outside of the consulting room to try and redress that balance of what I'm doing of my unintended consequences. For the charging, this was interesting because I spoke to the partner about it, and 
And actually, it one of the partners turned out not only that he didn't want, actually wants us to charge, but probably wouldn't have charged it either. Again, that's perhaps not true for every partner, um, but I think I would have been in a situation of charging thinking the partners would have wanted it when actually they wouldn't have done. So again, it's a simple message that that communication can, can often help. Um, although one bugbear of mine is, is partners wanting their assistants to charge for things they don't. Um, so I di didn't charge them. The thing I probably wish I'd done is, ma is made, a, made it clear that we weren't charging, at least as now I'm working for the RSPCA, I love hearing about vets uh, who haven't charged for IET and have gone above and beyond. It, it sort of helps uh, uh, in increase or repair my respect for the profession. I don't, that's, I, it's still nice to keep that smiling goat on there. The colleague's, owner, uh, the colleague's error, I didn't inform the owner. I thought I have a duty here to my colleague. Again, whether that was just a way for me to justify not having a difficult conversation. Um, I did speak to the vet about it. Um, and I framed it as warning that this is a compl complication that happened from your surgery. Not warning as in I'm going to tell the owner next time. But just as useful uh, feedback. I couldn't do much more than, than sympathise with the, the nurse. My error, I did inform the owner because I didn't feel I had that duty not to inform the owner because of the colleague. And actually that was one of the horriblest, loveliest conversations I think I, I've, I've had. The owner was absolutely on side. I didn't make any effort to seem some sort of cold, impassionate, I, that was long gone anyway, cold, impassionate veterinary surgeon. Um, and actually I think she really responded to that. And I think the fact that colleagues were, were distressed as well, uh, again, it, it made us all feel we're on the same side and bad stuff happened. Um, on my other error, <laughs> I just stayed as a superhero. I thought, I thought there's got to be some, some perks to this job. Thank you very much. <laughs>